Hi fellow rock hounds, I uh, hope all your rocks and your gems and fossils are treating you well and keeping your love of the sport healthy. Um, today I want to talk briefly about peanut wood, one of my favourite lapidary materials. And I've got some in this bucket here. So first of all, we'll have a look at the, before we go into the details, we'll look at the rough stuff, what it looks like. Quite a nice rock, even when it's rough. And even nicer when it's cut. So, what are we looking at? The um, why is it called peanut wood? Now, I'm certainly no expert. I'll tell you what I think. These round white marks on the black background are what people have uh, called peanuts. <laughs> They're obviously not peanuts, but the little marks are very similar. As I understand, these are caused by holes that a marine clam borer causes in the, the wood before it gets petrified. So you've got, so you end up with a lump of wood uh, floating in the water or sunk to the bottom of the uh, ocean. These marine um, clam borers attach to the wood and start chewing away, causing these holes. The holes are later infilled over thousands and thousands of years with uh, like minerals. So what you end up with is, is a solid rock again, looking like this, a black background and the, and the white holes in it. Depending on which angle you look at the rock, for instance, this angle that the peanuts or the infilled holes are, oops, very visible. And then on another angle, if I can find it, I'll just search around here. You can see they're elongated. That's from looking from another angle. Yeah, this is a good example. Peanuts or the infilled holes visible as round that way and as long infilled tunnels, if you like, from that angle. Right, now what I'll do at this point on the video is I'll, um, while I'm editing, I'll insert some photos of the marine clam borers. They are a um, Torito species, oh, th their nickname is a Torito worm and um, I'm sure that that name Torito is in their scientific name. It might be, I'll check up when I insert the photo, but I think it's Torito navalis. So that gives you a look at the Torito worm. Uh, I asked my friend Belinda, who lives in Western Australia, to send me some photos of the area where um, the peanut wood is found and picked up. And she was nice enough to do it. So here's a look at them.
go for a bit of a walk to my stockpile and we'll see if we can find uh, some pieces that have already been cut so I can show you the nice flat cut surfaces. one to show you. Yeah, that will do us. So here's a few nice pieces uh, uh, that I've been cutting in the past. And you can see the nice flat edges on them. And here we go again pulling out heavy rock with one hand and holding an iPhone with the other hand. So bear with me. Yeah, this one shows it nicely. See the peanuts? Various sizes or where the clams have made various size board holes in the driftwood. Driftwood is a term used by researchers for how this is um, uh, created. But also, um, another term they use is woodfall, which I've never fully understood the theory of woodfall, but just for the video, I'll, I'll put it on there. Yeah, that one's different altogether see a lot more black background and you can decide yourself what's the nicest piece there here we go heavy heavy and these are more manageable here we have another color again where the peanuts are more yellowish brown colour. Maybe influenced by a different minerals while it was forming. Different variation, the peanuts are a lot smaller than usual. They have that slight yellow colour. See in there, see the grain of the original wood. The camera will pick it up. The rings going that way. And this last little fella with a loft cut. Maybe the original wood was riddled with holes, almost continuously joined together. All white and hardly any dark material. There you go. Okay, I've chosen a little piece and we'll take it over the cutting shed and uh, cut a slice and, and polish it up and see how it goes. I've chosen this piece here. There is a bit of fracturing here. There's something going on here. So when we cut through it, See if it holds together. Yeah, you might be able to see the fracturing better on that angle. We'll cut through it, see how it holds together, and uh, see if we can get away with it. Yeah, you're wondering, what's with the glove? Well, I put a wood saw through my hand some time ago, and this sort of helps hold my hand together. You can see, and there's steel plates, two steel plates put in there, but it's pretty good. A lot of flexibility return. See how we go. Yes, the glove is very tight and offers a lot more. Um, flexibility in my hand while I'm working with these rocks. All right.
Okay, I think that's turned out all right. I've cut a nice, purposely cut a nice thick slice because of that fracturing that I saw through there. And uh, it's held together well. Nice, thick, robust slice. So I'll take that over to the polishing area. And my preferred polishing method is the variable speed sander. Uh, 100 millimeters or four inch um, the sander has a, a um, where is it? variable speed wheel there to make it uh, the, go faster or slower you keep it on a slow to medium speed and you apply the start off with the rigid Velcro lap discs to um, start your smoothing off and any scratches and then move on to the soft flexible diamond grit discs and you'll work through from a low grit such as 50 through the grits up through the grits to 10,000 then finishing on the bench grinder with this stitch size or wheel. Once we get to the bench grinder size or wheel stage, we'll apply a smear of um, uh, polish on there, a metal polish, which is a um, like a cerium oxide or similar, might be aluminium oxide. I'm not sure. Suspended in a in a gel. A uh, very easy way to, to get your cerium oxide finish on your rock. Now a nice, nice well-lit area such as this doorway. The sun coming in is a perfect way to assess your rock before you start polishing. I see no major scratches in there. This is straight off the saw. So I think we'll jump straight to a 240 grit. Rigid. Uh, alloy lap disc on the sander. So what I'll do now is uh, keep this rock wet all the time using this water tray here and work the disc on it from above. Right, I'm just going to dummy polish this for you and show you what I do. The hard lap disc is still on, to, as I said before, to t remove most of the scratches. Now after I've worked the surface and think I've got most of the scratches out, keep rotating the rock, turning and work the surface, I start this action on the edges. I start turning the rock slowly and getting all of the edge so I end up with a slight chamfer now what this does you'll often find scratches find scratches on the flat surface near the edge of what you're polishing what this does is, is start a rounded edge it gets these scratches out it works this area more heavy because the because the disc goes out works over it gets these scratches out and also the rounded edge gives a different reflection of light the light 
dances on the surface and then catches the polished rounded edge and makes the polished slab look a bit better. Right, next job now is to dry this off with a rag and hold it in the sun and inspect for scratches in the light before we move on to the next disc. Yeah, if you can catch the light and the rocks fairly dry, scratches will show up as white, faint white lines. Now I see none in that. There would be micro scratches that cause a haze over it, but all in all, this is ready to move on to the next stage, which is the first of the soft disks flexible discs made of sort of a uh, resin material or plastic I don't know and this is a 50 grit Now what's happening as you're polishing after each dip in the water it's you're drying the rock you can use this to your advantage by almost polishing it dry and you'll be able to see the scratches the same way as you as you purposely dry and hold it to the light Or if the camera can pick it up, there's scratches there, and one over there that I've got to work on. I'll take over the light to show you. See the scratches? There's no point in moving ahead in the grits until them scratches are um, buffed out, for want of better words, or polished out. So we'll stick with the 50 for a bit more and work on that area. You can see them scratches are gone. The remaining white marks are more in the original rock. Small cracks. So we're ready with the scratches removed. We're ready to go through the remaining grits. Uh, in my experience this rock will require a touch with a 100, a 200, then we're going to jump to an 800, then we're going to jump to a 5000 and finish with a 10,000. Uh, the, the rest of the polishing is fairly easy. We just use these discs and even amount on the rock until we uh, reach the last one. Now, in regards to timing, I usually work uh, with each disc for two minutes, maybe three, on uh, with each disc on the on the surface of the rock and over the the chamfer, and then I move on to the next disc. It doesn't take long at all now. Now, 
Now I have seen comments on my videos asking just how long do you polish with each um, size grip with each pad. I'll show you what I do. You can adapt this for your own methods. I hold the rock in the palm of my hand and I turn it four times. One, two, upside down, three, and four. Now for each of them times, I go around once, five times, five times around all the surface of the rocks. That's yeah, about five times, and I turn, one, two, three, four, five. Turn the rock to the third position, five times around, and to the last position, five times around. Then I have a picked point on the rock. In, what, in this case, it's the very pointy end of the rock there. And I start my quick buff of the chamfer. That's it. Move on to the next pad. Keeping in mind on the initial pads, the 50 grit and the rigid alloy lap disc, you've got to work it as long as it takes until the scratches are gone. There's no time limit, depending on the material, how hard it is, uh, how many scratches are in it. You keep working it so all the scratches are gone, have a look in the light, and then move on to the higher grits, which are fairly quick, as I said. Right, I'll let you on, in on a trick with your really high grits. I've just done my 5,000 and my, you can't read my writing, 10,000. Now what I do with these, just bear with me. I learned this trick from someone in my Facebook group over in England, is instead of dipping, dip the rock, do it your five times around, turn, five times around, turn, and so on and so on, four times. But then, give it a few more, work it until the water's gone away, and don't dip it. Now keep working your disc on it, turn it, maybe give it a dip, but then really buff it. The rock will get hot, as it dries out, it doesn't matter. You'll feel it warming up on your, on your fingers, holding it. But what happens is it burns, for want of a better term, it burns this shine into it. The good thing is the shine it burns into it. I'm not finished, I've only done this, dried it once. I've got three more burning ends to go, so it's gonna come up a lot better. The good thing, brings an excellent shine. The bad thing, it wears your discs out. Now, can you see the reflection on the disc? It's starting to get glazed over. But what the hell? These discs are about 20 Australian dollars for a set. And you get six or eight discs in it. The better ones might be 30, touching 40 Australian dollars. I don't care, it's worth it to get polishes like that. To wear your discs out and I'm not talking about your disc wearing out in a few hours it'll still go for 12 months doing this it's just that it might have gone for two years instead of 12 months big deal it's worth it and uh, just regarding that last comment about burning in another trick is to have two two 10,000 discs one I use for burning, burning in, and one of my older discs, and uh, a newer one for when I'm just using all wet work to do a finish. So there's another tip for you. 
Okay, we finished with the sander. We've uh, tacked this over the light. Got quite a nice polish on it now. I might spin that around for a better and catch the light. Yeah, you can see the. I don't know if you can see that polish on there. Now, usually, we've got such a nice polish on that today, I'm not going to take it any further. It's pointless, it's a waste of time, you're not going to get much better than that. But I'll show you, if you didn't have such a nice polish on the rock, what the next stage will be. It's simply, I've reversed the rock so that I'm not going to ruin my polish. Um, apply a finger dab, a, s a small bead of metal polish, one that has uh, cerium oxide or aluminium oxide suspended in gel, such as this product does. And uh, just smear it all around, it'll go white. Bring it over to the bench grinder, the stitched sisal wheel. And bring it up to a buff, which will be uh, similar, to that, similar to that. Easy as that, takes about two minutes. All right, folks, that's the job finished. I hope you've uh, got something out of that video. Uh, so interesting, the story of the peanut wood, right from the rough rock through to a nice polished item. And uh, we'll tie it up at that. I'll show you the finished product. Thanks for watching the video.